Let's just get this out of the way. The Northman is so far my favorite film of the year, and quite honestly has already cracked my top 50 of all time. So you know that the movie we're talking about here is something special. They simply do not make movies like this anymore. Remember the days of the historical epic? No, 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 not those days. Go back to the years when the likes of Ben-Hur, The Longest Day, Cleopatra, Gone with the Wind, or Lawrence of Arabia dominated the the box office. However you might feel about each of those movies individually, there is a universal quality in which all of them excel. Spectacle. Oh so glorious, gorgeous, gigantic spectacle. Whether it be the relentless storming of Aqaba that we witness from afar, or the moment the Allies overwhelmed the beaches of Normandy, this class of movie gave us a visual feast of chaotic battles, hundreds of humans clashing at once that so many movies try to replicate now, thanks to CGI, but often, not always, but often, instead create hollow facsimiles of. The raw, real spectacle that we're talking about here probably hasn't been captured on film since the first Lord of the Rings. Until Robert Eggers decided to tell his version of Viking Hamlet. The Northman is here, folks, and when I say it's here, I mean it has f arrived. Just like with The Witch and just like with The Lighthouse, Eggers has delivered a third consecutive stone-cold masterpiece, making for one of the most impressive directorial debut trilogies of all time. But where that first film redefined horror cinema, and the second is a psychological thriller unlike anything else you've ever seen, The Northman is in many ways Eggers' most conventional film to date diving into the tale of Amleth, the ancient Viking inspiration for Hamlet. For inspiration of his own, Eggers tells a story of revenge and fate that, in some ways, feels familiar, but also gives us by way of that oh-so-important spectacle I mentioned, the definitive piece of Viking media that I think we've quite frankly ever gotten. I mean, let me present Exhibit A. The movie is filled with this. Okay, okay, sure, we gotta have more than that, right? The movie has to mean something beyond spectacle, right? It's the reason so many of those other movies work. They're rich with character study, character development, narrative, intrigue, themes. You wouldn't see someone who's actually watched the movie say Lawrence of Arabia is just a bunch of shots of people crossing the desert on camels. Well, The Northman is definitely not just shots of Alexander Skarsgård looking furious in the fjords while he cuts throats and earns a place in Valhalla. This is a rich, twisted adaptation of the legend of Amleth that is secured by some of the best performances of the year so far, the right mixture of mythological and Shakespearean influence while still wearing Eggers' unmistakable voice and penchant for dark humor and historical authenticity down to the f***ing blades of grass. And, one more time, an undeniable overload of some of the best cinematic spectacle we've gotten in years. The Northman is a sheer triumph. It's the coming of age moment for Viking movies. And speaking of coming of age, you might as well get ready for an entire month of crawling around shirtless and howling like a wolf because Rage Shadow Legends also comes of age, celebrating three years of being one of the top role playing games out there. Remember the first time you ascended the Doom Tower, the 120-foot gauntlet filled with new and terrifying bosses? Well, as a high-level collection RPG, Raid hasn't just given us quantity, they've given us quality. And of course, there's the newest and biggest addition to Raid, the Hydra. It's without a doubt the biggest, baddest, and scariest boss to ever set foot in Teleria. This month, Raid's celebrating its three-year anniversary, and they've got an insane amount of things in store. We're talking new champions, new artifact sets, and a full month of special events and tournaments. If you're not playing yet, hit my link in the description or scan the QR code here on the screen, check the game out, and you'll get a special huge birthday package worth $40. We're talking three free champions at once, plus 10 magic XP brews, 10 force XP brews, and 10 spirit brews. That's huge, and the gifts keep coming. All this treasure will be available to you only for the next 30 days and only for new players here. 
All new and existing players can get a bunch of free birthday gifts worth over $25. Once you're in-game after clicking on the links, just enter promo code 3 years raid to get your hands on your gift. And it's that easy. Just click the link in the description below and I will see you in the game. And thank you so much to Raid Shadow Legends for sponsoring this video. So, your father's been murdered in front of you by his illegitimate heir of a brother, your future is in tatters, and you are dead in the minds of all who knew you, all while you're still a child. Sounds like it's time to become a Viking, right? Well, but hold on there for a second, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. We should talk about what makes the Northmen the Northmen. I mean, this is Hamlet, right? Well, yes, but also no. The tale of Amleth is the tale of Hamlet. They're essentially one and the same, with the core being an heir taking revenge against the killer of his father, the king, and reclaiming what is rightfully his. A lot of that is definitely in The Northmen, but it's not a one-to-one -one adaptation. There's a sprinkling of Oedipus Rex in Amleth's plan to intentionally rescue his mother rather than inadvertently marry her, but the movie consults Macbeth almost as much as it does its main influence of Hamlet. For one, and the fact that Amleth all but receives his quest in the story through prophecy, reinforced later on by the witch-like seer played by Bjork, and in several dreamlike moments where he sees images of what is to come has no roots in Hamlet, whereas the three witches and a recurring set of prophecies are partly what guide Macbeth through the titular play. On top of that, Gudrun is more of a Lady Macbeth than she is Gertrude. There is blood on her hands from having tactically sanctioned the murder of Amleth's father. She did not desire Amleth as a son, feeling that he was forced upon her and she has little use for him as an adult. And like the scheming Lady Macbeth, she tempts Amleth with an incestuous workaround for his revenge, one which she presents for him after she has already broken him down emotionally. She is an active villain in this story, whereas Gertrude is more of an ignorant, not quite innocent, bystander. All of that being said, The Northman eases you into its Shakespearean smorgasbord, giving you a sort of act zero for Hamlet in its opening minutes, setting you up for what you think the movie will be before broadening its storytelling after the inciting incident. There's a lot that The Northman does in its first few minutes, before the plot proper kicks off when Amleth's father is murdered by Fjolnir. Eggers starts this story by showing us where it ends, at the base of an active volcano known as the Gates of Hell. An early aside, Robin Carolan and Sebastian Gainsborough come right out of the gate from the very first note with what is arguably the best score in a Robert Eggers film. I mean, just listen to how much atmosphere and tension they get out of a simple drone. It's always complementing the story perfectly, as any great score should do but it also calls just enough attention to itself to stay in your mind long after the story has ended. It's Eggers' primal invitation to embark on a ruthless journey of blood and brimstone. It's similar to how you should go into Hamlet, really. After that brief moment of establishing where we will end up, the Northman wastes no time in showing us where we came from. Practically the first thing we see is Amleth as a boy beaming at the return of his father. We meet his mother, who in hindsight is putting on a good show of pretending to be overjoyed, and before we've even properly understood where home is for this family, we're in the dark hall of their castle, with Ethan Hawke immediately establishing Amleth's father as a powerful yet adored force in this kingdom. He is a man who adores his family, but who also holds wicked conviction about his power as king. He is such a presence in this one scene that you imagine he'll be on the throne for a significant amount of the movie. Well, we'll get to that. First, Amleth is no longer a mere boy. He must take his first, most vital step towards being a man in the culture of these Vikings. He must be awoken to what awaits him. And so father and son share a sort of vision quest, howling as wolves, drinking out of a bowl, hands free like wolves, to be told of the same fate that awaits them in order for Amleth to mature. Amleth is not even a boy in the context of this ritual. He is a dog yearning for his personhood. And in his future, the king must die by the sword honorably, for Valhalla awaits. 
whereas Amleth must rise to hold his throne and be a man as strong and as fearless as the king he succeeds. It is prophesied that Amleth must choose between kindness for his kin and hate for his enemies. But what is more than that, Amleth must avenge the death of his father, for he will fall by the sword of one who wishes to usurp him. Amleth weeps at the revelation of his destiny, one which demolishes his childhood innocence. The last tear you will shed, says the fool who guides the ritual, which will be given back to Amleth when he needs it. Again, you would think we're witnessing a premonition of what will come much later in the film, but no. Just as quickly as Amleth learns his destiny, it is brought upon him. Fjolnir, the half-breed illegitimate brother, brutally kills the king in front of Amleth the morning after this ritual. Fjolnir tries to have Amleth killed as well, but the boy escapes while Fjolnir sacks his own kingdom, slaughtering most of the people for their loyalty to the now dead king. And as Amleth flees to the unknown, he repeats the mantra of his quest, his destiny. I will avenge you, father, I will save you, mother, I will kill you, Fjolnir. Phew, okay, that was a lot all at once, right? The movie must be front-loaded as hell if it's just blasting through its story so quickly. Isn't this movie about, like, what, two and a half hours long? Yeah, it is, but here's the thing. This pace never lets up. But the movie never repeats beats, either. There's just a lot that it has to say, and it doesn't bog you down in the life of a Viking, although you get a pretty good sense of what that life is just based on the journey. The journey ahead of Amleth is long and difficult, and the victory that awaits him at its conclusion is only going to be satisfying if we see him work to achieve it. If we wanted an easy path there, Eggers could just, you know, skip to Amleth as the absolute beast of an adult he becomes, have him return home, stab fuel near, boom, movie's over. That's almost the pace the movie seems to start at, sure. But that'd be a deeply unsatisfying short film if that was all there is to it. No. Eggers instead carefully sculpts the narrative so that it always propels forward, adding layers and twists to the narrative so that it can feel complete without ever losing its breakneck pace. And sure, a lot of that is just basic storytelling, but few movies constantly rush forward the way The Northman does, so being able to tell a complete, epic story that is always building upon itself and never retreading backwards is a huge accomplishment. In fact, the only time the narrative steps backwards is when Amleth literally goes back for his final revenge after he has escaped to safety, making the decision that seals his fate, intertwining it with destiny. Because of course, we're still dealing with Hamlet here. And yes, again, the tale of Amleth came before and inspired Hamlet, we all get that, but we're in 2022. And the reality is that Shakespeare in Hamlet is quite possibly the most recognized dramatic work in existence, at least to the Western world. And you can't have Hamlet with a happy ending, because then it just isn't Hamlet. But the story the Northman tells isn't about how every character finds a way to get themselves killed, save for a single observer, a line of corpses that ends at the feet of a very much alive ex before Horatio. Rather, the story is of Amleth largely causing carnage to those he desires, and even inadvertently some people that he doesn't wish to bring harm to, with death being a particularly deliberate thing throughout the film, one that is almost entirely doled out by our hero. In fact, Amleth is is such a magnificently, horrifically capable killing machine that damn near everything imaginable goes right for him up until the very last, when he murders his mother and child half-brother in self-defense at the cost of much of his strength in forcing a fatal confrontation with Fjolnir at the gates of hell rather than the cold-blooded murder he had orchestrated. But even that, he kind of knew the outcome that was going to happen. What makes it all more tragic is how, during his quest, Amleth met and even impregnated the love of his life. They had secured safe passage away from Fjolnir after having taken pretty much everything away from him, and he had an opportunity to live a life with Olga in peace. But his thirst for revenge, his belief that he is a captive to his fate, 
was ultimately Amleth's doom. It's also worth noting that beyond Shakespeare or any other literary influences, The Northman is something of a stripping away of the twisted glamour often associated with Vikings. It's only been in recent years from the show Vikings to God of War to Assassin's Creed Valhalla, maybe a little bit of Game of Thrones if you look at certain storylines, that the aesthetic of Viking in Norse culture has become a big part of pop culture. But the thing about these pieces of media is that they all kind of revel in the violence associated with the culture. Vikings, for example, would have you think that the violence is all that the Vikings were. And yes, these were an often violent people, sacking towns, murdering entire populaces, living to conquer. There's a lot of truth to that. But what Robert Eggers has done here is deliver an honest critique of the cycle of violence that Vikings would participate in while still celebrating the things he does love about their culture. Particularly in the Scandinavian countries, a lot of the resurgence of this time period's popularity seems to be rooted in an interest in the cultural and anthropological element rather than just the brutality and violence. There's more to Vikings than that. Robert Eggers is aware of that. Amleth becomes aware of it as the movie progresses, and this idea is driven further home by the cast of The Northmen and the richness of the characters they portray. Let's talk about these goddamn performances. Ugh! This story of fate, of destiny, is channeled through rich characters who are portrayed across the board by master craftspeople of the performing arts. Willem Dafoe is in the movie for all of 90 seconds, and yet, as is usual for the legendary actor, he completely steals the show as the at-first rambling but ultimately profound jester who gives our hero his vision quest. He literally disappears from the movie after those first few minutes, or unless you count his disfigured head that shows up later on, and yet the impression he leaves on the rest of the movie is massive. For the second time in a row, Robert Eggers has collaborated with Defoe to create a titanic performance with barely a fraction of the screen time he had in The Lighthouse. He barely interacts with the three other actors during his time on screen, and yet, you feel his presence and his words throughout the rest of the runtime. The same could easily be said for Ethan Hawke, who maybe gets to have a minute more screen time than Defoe, playing a pretty thankless role overall as the standard mentor to hero who gets killed in the beginning that we've seen in who knows how many films. I went into this earlier, but it's really impressive how fully realized his king is in all of one scene, one shot even, considering he gets speared and beheaded about five minutes later. Nicole Kidman comes in right after getting an Oscar nomination with another of her canonical performances, coming to truly shine when the truth of Gudrun comes to light. Her viciousness, her apathy towards her firstborn son, her dismissal of his attempts to reclaim what he has lost for her as much as for himself are performed with great relish by Kidman. She has her own grappling with fate. That that her and Fjolnir can manifest the future they desire, but only through violence, the language of the land, and killing. By adhering to the norm, they continue to walk the same predetermined path as those who have wronged them and who they seek to separate themselves from. They're cynical, and similar to Amleth, products of the brutality of the world that forged them. However, unlike Amleth and Olga, they don't seek to change. Their answer is to conform. Gudron has protected her augmented family for some 20 odd years this way and will continue to do so no matter the cost. She's one until the moment her firstborn son returns and holds a sword to her throat. Kidman's also enjoying the hell out of this part and it makes the character that much more entertaining as awful of a person as she turns out to be. It's really one of the best love to hate this person characters I can think of in recent memory. Anya Taylor-Joy is her usual brilliant self for a lot of her time on screen, but her final scene, her mournful command of her situation after her love all but abandons her, is a testament to why she's getting all of the movie roles right now and why she deserves a thousand more. Olga is the brains to Amleth's brawn, utilizing her deep cunning in order to advance his plot to their mutual benefit. She's not a red herring who turns on Amleth at any point. She simply falls in love with him and wants to be free with him, and she uses every ounce of her formidable intelligence to make it work. And then there's Clay Bang's villain, one for the ages, one whose brutality is abundantly clear in the beginning when Fjolnir is younger, who seems to be a 
beaten down and mellowed out old man later on, and he is more or less, but whose defiant insistence on being more than a bastard half-brother, a rightful victor rises back to the surface in the finale of the film with glorious intensity. But there is a hero to this story too both in the movie itself and among the cast, and that hero's name is Alexander f***ing Skarsgård. My god, these other performances I've talked about are all really incredible. A couple of them might even prove to be in contention among the best of the year, but Skarsgård in this movie, this work in particular, is arguably pushing itself among the greatest leading performances ever, certainly one of the most memorable ones. Right from the moment we see Amleth as an adult, we can see the gears spinning in Skarsgård's eyes, always plotting his next move. He's reluctantly built himself up as a warrior, ingratiated himself deeply within the band of Vikings he lives with, and yet does not hesitate to drop them all in an instant when he learns of an opportunity to finally meet his destiny. At this point, he's a man who is solely driven by the fate that awaits him. He even walks out, swims rather, on his wife and unborn child for the sake of meeting destiny and fate. His actions reflect the core idea of the film as a whole. Are fate and destiny truly set in stone? Can we truly not avoid it, even if we attempt to? The storyline gives him an out. He's a brutal, ruthless, murderous protagonist who has committed untold amounts of slaughter, and when he has an opportunity to change, he instead gives in to what has defined him up to this point. It's the same choice that was prophesized, kindness for his kin or hate for his enemies. As he declares during the climax, I choose both. He frees his unborn child of the cycle of violence that has defined him, while he also strikes Fjolnir down with furious vengeance, ultimately shattering the stranglehold of the old world. The only suitable fate for him at that point has to be death. He has atonement to make. Dying is the only way he can break the cycle of violence he was a product of. It's the only way he can ensure that he does not corrupt his children and therefore his bloodline any further. Amleth recognizes that he's part of the problem and that because of the blood, fire, and violence in which he was forged, there will always be that animal within him. In order for his family, his lineage to have a better future, to break that cycle, he must remove himself from the equation. He has that conversation with Olga about how hate is all I've ever known. I wish I could be free of it. That's kind of his whole outlook on the matter. He's too far gone and believes himself to be a captive to his fate, and may as well give his reign of violence some meaning while simultaneously putting an end to the old world. He's so cynical on the matter, similar to his mother and Fjolnir, which speaks to how a lot of us today feel that nothing will change and we're all captive to the vicious cycle we continue to experience in the world. Contrast this with Olga, who, while also a victim of her fate, sees salvation in a life with Amleth and her unborn children. She sees a new world that awaits them and sees that they can, in fact, break the cycle, determine their own destiny outside the confines of what their barbaric society has deemed the right way. That's why she responds to Amleth's jaded, self-loathing, hopeless comment with, that is for you to choose. Let's find our future. She is a believer in choice, not a predetermined fate. When Amleth decides to leave Olga, it's also tying back into the idea of choice versus destiny. Through Olga, Amleth comes to understand choice, and he chooses to confront his destiny. It's not necessarily that he's still a captive to it. At that moment, he just has the self-realization that his children with Olga are now a living thread that binds them together, and by extension, binds them to his fate. He wishes to free them of his fate the only way he knows how, by way of the sword. On the other hand, when Amleth is in combat, he's blindly focused on survival, slaughter, and victory. Nothing will stand in his way. His intensity and focus both in and out of combat are readily apparent on Skarsgård's face. The dude has always been in shape too, but for the Northmen, he's become an absolute tank, largely, if not exclusively, doing his own stunts and pushing himself to the absolute limit the way his character is in every set piece. But that doesn't mean he's just a hard-edged badass and nothing else. If anything, 
the opposite is true. This is a deeply soulful performance, and it's what makes Skarsgård the perfect choice to play Amleth. Amleth is a man in pain with regret for his actions, but must trudge along regardless because it's his destiny. The number of emotional layers that come in every scene, learning the truth about his mother and learning that Olga is pregnant with his child being two of the standout moments are sometimes too many to count. In universe though, Olga seems to be the only one who notices this. The other characters fawn over Amleth's most toxic traits, his strength, his ability to be this brutal primal killer. To be a man in this world means only one thing, to be tough and quick to anger and violent and stoic. There's no room to mourn or be sensitive or merciful. Grief can wait. Blood and vengeance is the answer. From the moment his tear was taken from him, all emotions not deemed alpha traits were stripped from him. All tender emotion suppressed. He was to become a killing machine, a beast who brings tears from the eyes of men. However, as Bjork's mage states, it's not enough to be the man that never cries. Contrary to traditional antiquated gender roles, men can be more than one thing, and this one-track mind is precisely what poisoned the mind of young Amleth. They're allowed to be vulnerable, sensitive, emotional, to be sad and cry. There can be so much toxicity in repressive traditions, and that repression is what enables more spite, begets more violence. It's such a pressing critique that truthfully speaks a lot to the times we live in now. Eggers has always looked to the past as a means to examine and critique the current state of the world, and the Northmen may be his most biting and effective commentary yet. And if all that isn't enough to sell you on how terrific a performance Skarsgård is giving here, this is also among the dirtiest, filthiest, most unashamedly vile I've seen an actor get for a role. And sure, makeup and prosthetics help, but it's undeniable that Skarsgård is getting right down in the literal dirt in some of these scenes too. You don't believe Skarsgård is playing Amleth while you watch The Northmen. You believe he is Amleth. And on top of all of that, the roaring intensity he brings to such sequences as the climax at the gates of hell, or even something smaller such as the proto-rugby match, is the kind of material that a lesser actor would turn into scenery chewing ham. But Skarsgård turns in deeply imposing and downright intimidating material. Movies have to do double duty with a hero's story in a way that literature does not. The storytelling has to be compelling, but the hero also has to be performed in a compelling way. Sometimes the latter can even compensate for shortcomings in the former, though thankfully The Northman is built on the foundation of a magnificent screenplay, an incredible leading man. And even if this script were deeply flawed, Skarsgård's work is so monumentally excellent that it probably would have brought the film back up to similar heights. Now, the story, the acting, the way the film charges full sail ahead, all of that is sublime. But when we started this journey, I emphasized spectacle. The fact that The Northman is a monumental piece of historical epic filmmaking and that the style and action in this film are some of the best we've had in years, if not decades. And so far, I haven't really gotten into that. After all, there are a lot of movies that have incredible casts and brilliant screenplays and great themes, pacing even, that aren't bombastic historical epics. Many movies accomplish that without a shot fired or a single clash of swords. That's decidedly not the case with The Northman. I mean, holy fucking shit, man. Like, this movie... If I was in high school when this movie came out, this would have defined my love of cinema. Not just from a storytelling perspective, but from a visceral filmmaking perspective. I can only imagine kids growing up and seeing this film for the first time on the big screen and falling deeply in love with cinema, with the craft that makes movies what they are. I mean, shit, man, this probably would have been my favorite movie ever if I saw it at the age of 15 or 16. It would have influenced everything that I love about movies, and I can already see that it's going to do that for young cinephiles. I just want to quickly circle back to something, though. This film begins with an erupting volcano, 
and is probably the least interesting thing in the entire movie. And that's saying a lot because it's an incredible opening shot. Eggers almost immediately outdoes the striking mixture of beauty and terror found in this opening shot with a series of elegant mini wonners in the opening scenes. Earlier, I mentioned how we barely get to know Amleth's original home before Eggers tears him away from it. That's still true from a narrative perspective, but it doesn't mean Eggers doesn't relish every last second we spend there. The King's much heralded return home is punctuated at the end as he goes into his castle and away from us by a row of servants and farm animals passing in front of the camera, reminding the audience that, for however beloved he may be, he is still ruling over people considered lesser. And when we are in the court of the king immediately after, rather than cutting from the king to his son, to his wife, to his brother, we meet all of the major players of the film in the same shot before Willem Dafoe's fool effectively breaks up the proceedings with the scenes first cut. Much of the coming of age ritual also occurs in a dynamic wonder between Defoe, Hawk, and the boy, as does much of the king's subsequent death scene, and Amleth's escape afterwards also takes place in a constantly moving yet claustrophobic wonder that ends in a calm, still tableau, emphasizing the silence that follows killing. Killing isn't something glamorous in this film, it's horrific, it's intimate and disturbing. In fact, wonners constitute a considerable percentage of the film's shots, and that's not because Eggers wanted to be flashy with the camera, but it's actually because it was the only way he knew how to shoot the set pieces, the action. He's not an action filmmaker, but he knows how to move a camera, and so he just did what came naturally to him. And that says a lot about the innate talent of Robert Eggers. I think one of the most impressive wonners, though, comes in the film's first major battle sequence, when Amleth and his adopted band of Vikings sack a town. The foggy approach to the town walls is this magnificently composed image that looks almost like a classical painting until someone hurls a spear at Amleth, who proceeds to catch it in midair and throw it back into the chest of the man who originally threw it. Then, Amleth, and Skarsgård for that matter, again doing his own stunts, scales the wall with his axes, clambers over and takes out a couple of guards and then dives onto another's horse from at least 12 feet up as he launches into a furious flurry of attacks. Eggers lets that entire sequence play out in profile, with the town being further defeated the more he ventures into it with the camera. It is absolutely breathtaking, and it's still only scratching the surface of what the Northman has to offer, which extends far beyond just the action sequences and one the Northman constantly accentuates its storytelling through visuals. Jaron Blaschke is always creating something that is gorgeously striking, frame by frame, but the story doesn't take a back seat just because the imagery is sublime. One of my favorite segments of the film occurs just as Amleth begins to set his plan in motion. He goes to see a new character outside of Fjolnir's village, who has with him the head of Willem Dafoe's character, who gave Amleth the original prophecy of his destiny. Amleth is essentially told through the long, decomposed head of a nigh mystical sword with which he will complete his quest. We then get a dark, dusty battle between Amleth and a skeletal corpse that guards the sword. Uh, yeah, it's f***ing awesome. Amleth is victorious, but then it is revealed that the battle was merely a vision, as the camera moves aside to reveal Amleth simply retrieving the sword without issue. Amleth needs not fight nor fear the shadows, for he is the shadows. This is conveyed without a word of dialogue by Eggers' direction and Blaschke's cinematography. It's but one example of this type of show-don't-tell storytelling, seamless blending of mysticism and reality, but I think it's the most prominent. And yet, as the film goes on, it's as if it tries to outdo itself. 
Amleth's slaughter of Fjolnir's guards, a slaughter that is a revenge in some cases, as some of these men were there when his father was murdered, again happens largely in profile, just like the first battle. Even when Amleth kills his mother and brother, the scene is lit by flame that almost seems like it will overwhelm the lighting at any moment, as if to parallel how Amleth does this almost reflexively, without outward emotion, but his inner turmoil at what he has just done is threatening to burst out of him. And then, of course, there's the finale at the Gates of Hell, which is just... Oh, it may be the best individual scene in any of Robert Eggers' three films. It's an indescribably epic showdown between Fjolnir and Amleth, the ultimate one-on-one -on -one struggle between uncle and nephew. These two naked men who would each be regarded as Adonises under normal circumstances are instead gradually becoming darkened with ash from the active volcano around them. Amleth, who has spent much of the film in dirt and filth, ends up at his most unhygienic here. The two men create sparks among the lava flows with their blades, each unleashing pure rage and intensity at one another. Fjolnir's youth returns to him like he is still the younger man murdering his brother. Eventually, it is clear that their fates are both decided, and it is only a few seconds after this is all but said aloud that Amleth is stabbed in the heart and Fjolnir loses his head. And even though his defeat of the villain has also resulted in our hero being fatally wounded, it's an explosion of catharsis when the simultaneous final blows are struck. This entire sequence is all of the movie's earlier spectacle, all of the possibilities it teased with that opening shot turned up to 11 and holding the audience captive. It's the tragic prophecy fulfilled, the death of the hero, and yet, is treated rightly so as a glorious moment as he ascends to Valhalla. The Northman is a masterpiece, seriously. It is the Norse epic for the ages, and we can say that because it has the blessing of Bjork herself. I said before that movies like Lawrence of Arabia or Ben-Hur don't really get made anymore, and I stand by that. The Northmen following in the footsteps of those cinematic titans is something I've always wanted, and I do want more of this. But at the same time, I don't want a bunch of pale imitations. I mean, you can't just go and make this movie. You have to have a Robert Eggers type of filmmaker impeccably craft it, corralling a team together who are all firing on all cylinders. It's insane that Focus Features took the gamble they did on this, a $90 million auteur viking epic. Who the hell thought of that? They should be getting a raise or a promotion or something. But in all seriousness, good on them, regardless of how it turns out at the box office. I hope it pays off. I really hope it pays off. Allowing an artist to do this, having the level of faith in them that it requires, should in itself be something that draws audiences to the cinema. It's honestly this epic miracle of a movie. It feels like the definitive Viking epic in the same way that Lawrence of Arabia was the definitive World War I epic and Ben-Hur was the definitive biblical epic. Yes, I'm going with Ben-Hur over the Ten Commandments. So when you sit down to watch the glorious Alexander Skarsgård get furious in the fjords, really soak it in. Who knows how long it'll be before we get another the Northmen.